Good afternoon. Thank you for coming along. I um, uh, hope you've enjoyed the rest of the fair. Uh, now for something completely new, something you won't have seen before and probably 10 years ago couldn't even imagine existing, the idea of uh, atomic clock that you can take with you. This is something I, you know, until I heard about it was assumed the sole preserve of, you know, places like MPL at Teddington. So uh, Richard uh, Hopdroff is going to lead you through the story. Um, so Richard, uh, come on, come on up and I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, my name is Richard Hoptroff. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how I started as a physicist, uh, went through various ventures, m many of which were related to time in, in various guises, and eventually got drawn into the world of watchmaking and uh, discovered the new and interesting things I could bring to it. And then we'll take a look at the uh, physics of timekeeping and exactly how that translates into a, uh, an atomic pocket watch. Uh, in the 80s, I did a bachelor's and then a PhD in physics uh, at King's College London. Um, while I was Googling for a picture, I came across this one, which is uh, from the 1940s. And uh, what I specialised in at the time was uh, astrophysics, which um, you'll see in my watches, you see repeated references to it in terms of celestial functions and so forth. Uh, I also specialised in, in optics, which turns out to be very important in timekeeping. And finally, in neural networks, which are a form of artificial intelligence. When I left university, um, I started my first uh, techno technology company. It was a software company uh, uh, specifically focusing on forecasting. Now, forecasting, of course, is recognizing patterns in the past and extrapolating them out into the future. So even fresh out of university, I was uh, sort of venturing in uh, time, time type technologies. Uh, a few years later, I sold that uh, company to a company in, uh, in Canada, and they asked me to go and work for them for a couple of years, and I did so. Um, during that time, uh, I learned to fly. And uh, one of the things that happened for me there was that I developed uh, a fascination for complications, uh, mostly in the origin of a, um, a, a cockpit readout and so forth. Um, the, my aviation career, if you like, uh, was stopped by this chappy um, who crawled into my pitot tube and once when I was taking off, I was accelerating up the runway, uh, but the airspeed indicator was not going above 50 miles an hour. So by the time I realised something was going wrong, um, I put on the brakes and did what the tower described as a real smoker of a stop, uh, ending up in the long grass off the end of the runway. And so I decided that after that, um, I think uh, uh, flying planes should be left to the professionals. However, the one legacy that that has left me with is uh, a fascination for watchmaking. Before learning to fly, I never wore a watch. Um, you're required to as a pilot, so I started wearing one and getting interested in them. Uh, at the time, nobody told me which wrist to put it on, so I, even though I'm right-handed, I, I put my watch on my right wrist, uh, which has all, always led me to a fascination of making products for left-handed people. One of our patents is to do with the ability to put a case on uh, either way up, so for a left-handed person, you simply put the case on the other way up and the buttons um, appear on the other side. Going on from there, I, I really got fascinated with uh, watchmaking, uh, particularly dial design. So I came up with all sorts of uh, complicated designs. Uh, the problem with this, though, 
was that I really had no way I could possibly uh, realise these uh, for real. I certainly had no advantage over any other watchmaker. Uh, so that was kind of on the shelf for a while. Um, and I, I took up a few things. I needed to get back to uh, Europe, so um, I sailed back. And during that time, in a 39-foot Santana, um, during that time, uh, we hit a gale uh, just out of uh, Bermuda. And uh, we did a lot of damage to the boat, including um, the, uh, losing the autopilot, so we all had to be at the helm for six hours a day. Uh, and the electrics became very dodgy, uh, not always working at all. So as a result, we had to dust down the sextant and make sure that we would always be able to navigate with respect to the stars and knowing the exact time uh, as a backup, because potentially we would need this uh, for marine navigation. And again, you'll see later on how elements of that are included in the number 10. At, in uh, 2001, I did a postdoc at Oxford in archaeology, um, actually dating the age of buildings. Uh, the way I did it is that um, when you, uh, when cosmic rays hit quartz, they excite atoms up to a certain level, and then when they're exposed to light, um, they give off um, a, 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 a photon of light also. So if you cover up uh, a material, for example, because you're building it, the cosmic rays will slowly increase the charge. And then when you expose it to light for the first time, the amount it glows is uh, proportional to how old, it, uh, how old the building is. So here we've gone again, this time I'm using optics to actually apply it not to the future, but to the, the past. Some of the things we've tried to date with that were the uh, Nazca lines in Peru. We got so-so results with that. Uh, the pyramids in Egypt, to try and date the order in which they were built, uh, we got good results with that. But the best results we got were in, um, in Israel, uh, dating the age of David's city, uh, proving that there was certainly a city around in Bronze Age times when David would have founded it. And also at Qumran, where the scrolls were found, we also proved that they were the, the the, the age they were expected to be. I then decided to do some watchmaking, or rather clock making. Uh, I designed this clock. Uh, it was built for me by Thwaites and Reed, a uh, UK uh, watchmaking company. It has uh, quite a few complications on it. At the top we have two counter-rotating celestial dials. On the uh, left we have a tellurium, so there's an Earth that rotates uh, once every 24 hours, and beyond that, a, a tidal indicator and a moon position indicator. Here we have an annual wheel that rotates once a year, and you can put uh, indications on it such as uh, sunrise and sunset that can be localized. And then at the bottom uh, is a entire month calendar. So uh, not only does this hoop indicate the uh, current date, but also you can see the day of the, the every, every date in the, uh, in the year, sorry, in the month. There's a side view of it, so you can see it was composed of uh, four different plates. Um, it's, it's my only purely mechanical timepiece. But then I got frustrated and ne needed to earn some more money, so I put the timekeeping aside for a little while um, and started a Bluetooth business. And um, if, I don't know if you're aware, but our watches are Bluetooth uh, enabled. And one of the reasons for this is uh, Hoptroff's sister company actually makes the Bluetooth units. Um, we also make uh, USB chips as well. And then suddenly, in around 2010, uh, two big changes happened. <coughs> Firstly, um, 
silicon chips started to be able to run at such low powers that you could do sophisticated calculations uh, powered from a coin cell. Secondly, very, very small stepper motors became available. Uh, inside each of those it are two, two coils, um, a stator unit, and uh, a gear train uh, gearing down the, the positions to be able to move quite a heavy pointer. And uh, these are, um, you can arrange them like Lego almost to give you quite a, a rich degree of um, innovation in dial design. So where we are today, um, the core design team is three of us. Uh, I head it up and uh, decide what we make, why we make it, and so forth. Um, I, I throw the equations at Mike, who then works out how to program in all of this into the microcontrollers. And uh, design director Sarah actually then goes ahead and works out how to make it look beautiful and um, how to package it and thinks through what the customer experience is, is actually like. Beyond that, we've, uh, we've come to rely on many, many people um, who've been able to help us, uh, people from Tidal consultants to goldsmiths. Uh, I will pick out, uh, in particular, special thanks to uh, Simon Micklemeyer of uh, Meridian, who's been tremendously helpful in uh, guiding me through some of the basics of, of watchmaking. Uh, this is where we're based, in Clink Street in, uh, in London. Uh, it's where the phrase, in the clink, comes from, uh, because uh, we're on the site of the old clink prison. Uh, here's a picture of it from uh, just after the war. You can see that it's, um, it's a, these are wharf buildings. And the ones on this side are, uh, go straight onto the river. They used to have bridges that come across to the ones on our side. So our design philosophy, although we have very sophisticated electronics, uh, we want a very sleek, traditional look on the outside. Um, we put on all, all of our watches uh, Londini in et Fesset, which is Latin for made and designed in London. Uh, it's something that's been a very traditional thing of watchmakers in the UK for a long time. This, for example, is a nib clock from uh, the 1700s, I think, or 1600s, maybe. Our manufacturing techniques are very different to conventional watchmakers. Uh, the movements are made by ourselves. Um, instead of having a, a, a plate on which we build things up, uh, we use a backbone, which is a circuit board. Uh, we then put motors and a protective case on them. Uh, we've had to learn how to make our own dials because we've had uh, design, uh, sorry, we, we've had uh, supply problems with the Swiss. So this is the first dial we ever made. They're made by uh, acid etching brass, then covering it with uh, UV enamel, and then uh, printing with an offset litho to get very, very fine line work. Um, we've pioneered laser sintering, which is a type of 3D uh, printing for metals. Uh, this was the first uh, laser sintered case ever made. Uh, it was done in steel. You can see the quality isn't particularly very good. It's very pocked. And it's taken us the last year to per perfect this to uh, a level that's commercially acceptable. Uh, this is a, a gold case where it's come straight out of the machine. And here, after it's polished up. And you can see the way those columns are. Uh, you just can't achieve that with any other technique. You couldn't do it by milling, for example. Laser sintering has its limits. So for example, this case for the number 10 um, it is milled uh, because we couldn't quite get it right in time. Uh, so we still use a, a mix of traditional techniques as well. Some things we can't achieve in this country. Uh, most of it is British, but uh, we have to confess that uh, the hands are Swiss. So just going through a number of our watches, uh, the number 11 uh, has an indication for the date 
um, and seconds. And this is a pendulum style second, so it takes 30 seconds to go one way, then it reverses and goes the other. And it's a nice, simple, classic design, uh, but with the Bluetooth connection, it can be a perpetual calendar, uh, automatically updates for uh, if you change your time zone and for daylight savings time. Uh, the number eight uh, has seconds and an appointment reminder. So this is the time of your next appointment and this is the first uh, letter of the diary entry. It gets this information from the calendar in your phone automatically. The number nine, uh, which is uh, causing the most interest amongst the watches, uh, has seconds as an indication and date and then at the bottom, we have a share price indication. So at the top, we have 10% price swing up, at the bottom, 10% price swing down, and you can select which actual stock uh, from your mobile phone. So taking a step back and just looking uh, very briefly at uh, the chronology of time, how our knowledge of it has changed over, over time, the Greeks were the first to, people to think about it, with uh, Parmenides saying, uh, time is an illusion, there is only the present. And in the opposite corner, Heraclitus said, no, time is how things change. You know, it defines us. Moving on a bit, uh, Newton was the first to develop the, um, the ideas further, and he actually formalized it uh, in what's called calculus, which is the, the measure of how things change with time. Uh, in the 1800s, with the uh, Industrial Revolution, uh, a series of people developed the laws of thermodynamics, and then uh, we started to realize that there's something very strange about time. Uh, you can go forwards and backwards, up and down, left and right. You can only go in one direction in time. Then it gets weirder. Einstein came along and realized that uh, when you move, time gets dilated. And then even later than that, he, uh, he discovered that uh, actual substance, actual matter, uh, dilates time as well. And where are we today? Well, on, in the one corner is uh, our Wheeler and DeWitt, and they say, just as Parmenides did, time is an illusion, there is only the present. And in the other corner, uh, Lee Smolin says that uh, time is how things change, it defines us. So, in fact, we're no further forward than uh, where we were when, um, in, in Greek times. In terms of timekeeping accuracy, from 4000 BC to around 500 AD, the best we could do is water clocks. Uh, they achieved about uh, five million seconds a year in accuracy or several hours a day. Um, that's mostly due to the change in viscosity of water as temperature changes. And what you'll find throughout timekeeping is temperature changes are always the problem. One of the most famous users of water clocks was Julius Caesar, the uh, founder of uh, ancient London. Then at around 500 AD, uh, Candle clocks uh, started to be used because they're a little more ac accurate. Um, in fact, ten times more accurate. So, so only only losing half a second. Uh, sorry, half a million seconds every year. Um, I do particularly like candle clocks because they introduce the first complication. As the candle burns down, it releases these little uh, weights that uh, hit a bell. The most famous user of candle clocks. Uh, was the founder of modern London, uh, Alfred the Great. After that, the, uh, the next improvement in accuracy uh, came with Christian Huygens um, with the pendulum. And so we're now getting an accuracy of 4,000 seconds a year. Yes, Christian himself. And then the next improvement was the development of temperature compensations by the likes of Graham and Harrison. So here's the Harrison Sea Watch number one with an accuracy of uh, uh, 400 seconds a year. 
Um, it's interesting to note that Big Ben is about 350 seconds a year. I mean, obviously, they, they adjust the time constantly, but if it left to run smoothly, it's not much more of an improvement over, um, over the Harrison watch. <clears throat> and then uh, the accuracy today is, is quartz accuracy. This is, um, this is my favorite, uh, one of my favorite timepieces. This is uh, when I bought at auction. It used to be uh, George Daniels. It was his only uh, digital watch. He didn't make it himself, but uh, and that has an accuracy. Well, this one doesn't ha have quite that accuracy, but the most accurate ones are about five seconds uh, per, per year, and they have temperature compensation. And they were invented by, uh, I've forgotten his first name, Mr. Cody. Um, in Bell Labs in the States. The most accurate timepieces we have today are atomic clocks. Um, they work by exciting uh, an atom from one energy level to another using a laser usually and then probing it with uh, a microwave resonator and tuning that resonator so that it exactly matches the, um, the energy given off when it uh, jumps down to the lower energy level again. <clears throat> These typically have an accuracy of... That doesn't seem right to me. Yes, it does. Uh, typically, an accuracy of uh, one and a half seconds per thousand years. And... A lot of people have been involved in developing these, but they were first uh, proposed by... Uh, Lord Kelvin uh, around the start around 1900. So atomic timekeeping today. Uh, the best atomic timekeepers are um, cool the cesium atoms down to zero degrees Kelvin, and uh, clocks such as this one at the National Physical Laboratory and the uh, the optical lattice clock in the Paris Observatory, I think it is. Um, have accuracies of one part in less than well, one second in less than a million years. So they're incredibly accurate. Uh, they achieve better than us because we uh, can't get down to absolute zero. The timekeeping unit we use is, uh, was developed for the US Department of Defense. Um, this uh, is a matchbox size unit and it runs with a current of about 30 milliamps. So it was seeing this and seeing that this was available uh, gave me the idea for actually making, uh, putting an atomic uh, timepiece together. There is a possibility in future that we, may, we will be able to make um, what are called micro-electromechanical -electro system uh, timepieces, which are essentially uh, solid-state atomic clocks. Uh, they won't quite have the accuracy of the, uh, the number 10, but as you can see, they're very small. So I think that the only way we'll actually have atomic wristwatches is to uh, wait for this technology to come along. Hopefully it will be possible in the next five years or so. Timekeeping beyond that, well, the last laugh is on Einstein. You try to achieve greater accuracy than that, relatively steps in and you suddenly notice that your clocks are disagreeing with each other, not because there's anything wrong with the clocks, but of course because they experience different times themselves uh, as they move through space. So it would be nice to be more accurate, but actually uh, time starts to lose its meaning after that. So going on to the number 10, uh, you've seen the uh, atomic clock unit in there. Um, because it's fairly large, we made the decision to use the space available to make a rather complicated clock, or we'll watch rather. Um, at the bottom we have uh, the seconds dial, so that ticks once per second. We've had a, a number of people say, why does it stop seconds? So why does it tick rather than be smooth? And we're capable of doing either. But what we d decided to do is uh, do the stop seconds because that's what the Harrison Sea Watch does. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, the, the time, which could be local time or Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, at the top, sidereal time, the time of the stars. 
Um, with the aid of a sextant, you can determine latitude and longitude. So you, uh, as the sun rises in the sky and gets past a certain height, you press the button. Uh, as it falls down on the other side, you press the button again, and it will determine latitude and longitude to within a mile. Uh, here we have power remaining. Uh, the day of the week, sorry, the day of the month. Uh, the compass heading, so magnetic compass heading. Uh, the month. The time error, so when you first set the time, that will go to here, and then slowly over time, as the errors accumulate, it will slowly inch up. Uh, temperature, pressure, and humidity, there are our sensors on board. Uh, we have uh, in the middle there um, the age of the moon. In the middle, uh, sorry, uh, the second ring is uh, the lunar transit, so when the, when the moon is overhead. Um, sun, sorry, the moon rise will be six hours before that, moon set will be six hours afterwards. The outside dial is the most complicated on, on the watch. It uh, shows uh, tide height in meters, um, and to achieve that, we've put in the, uh, the eight tidal harmonics for each of 3,000 ports around the world. Using the latitude and longitude data, it locates the, uh, the closest of those ports in order to uh, display the tide height. And around the side, we have um, little indicators that show the state of the atomic clock. So the top one here is, the, uh, is whether the laser is on, off, and stable. The bottom one is whether the oven is on, off, or stable, or at the correct temperature, rather. On here, whether the microwave resonator is on, off, or locked. Uh, the charge state, so whether the whole system is charging, discharging, or in storage. At the bottom, these are the atomic indicators. On the left is the power mode, so it's currently pointing to pure atomic, um, where you would uh, need to recharge the, uh, the phone every two or three days. The middle selection is uh, atomic di disciplined quartz, where you could get uh, probably 180 d days worth of power out of the unit. Sorry, days worth of timekeeping. Um, and the last one is, is simply temperature compensated quartz if you're really running low on battery. The second indicator is whether the uh, atomic uh, resonator itself is on, off, and whether it's uh, locked on to the correct frequency. And uh, just for a bit of fun, all of these eyes actually have LEDs behind them, and once a minute they glow. So. so there you have it. It's, um, it's been a crazy, stupid project to take on. It's uh, set back the launch of our company by over a year. Um, and it's certainly by far the most complicated thing I've ever designed. But uh, judging by the reception we've had today, it's, it's been absolutely worth it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, the laser sintering of the gold cases will be for manufacturing, yes. Um, laser sintering is um, it's, it's not cheaper, but it, you can achieve much greater flexibility with it. Uh, you, can just, you can do things that you can't do with milling. The second advantage of it, it is that it keeps batch sizes very low. Um, if you're milling, it's very hard to do it with a batch size of less than 100 units. With laser sintering, uh, you can do it with four units quite happily. Um, 
And of course, if you're working with gold, there's a lot of money in 100 units. So uh, that's one of the biggest advantages it has. I'm sorry, I'll have to say that again. Um, the, the question was, uh, did we come close to running out of memory for it? Uh, yes, we, we, we will run out of memory by the time we design the second dial and complete putting all of that tidal information in for the 3,000 ports, but uh, we can always stick in more memory chips. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.